Good evening, everyone. My name is James Kenley. I'm the executive director of the Vail Symposium. And on behalf of our board chair, Dale Mosier, and our entire board of directors, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. The Vail Symposium has been offering affordable, thought-provoking program, programming to the Vail Valley since 1971. We're celebrating our 51st birthday this year. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, and ticket sales cover less than 15% of our operating revenue. Donors at every level help bring our mission to life in our community. And I'd like to thank a few organizations and individuals that make our programming possible. Our presenting sponsors are the Town of Vale and the Frechette Family Foundation. Our event sponsors are Vale Resorts Epic Promise, the Vail Daily, and the Antlers at Vail. This special series, called the Conversations on Controversial Issues with Clay Jenkinson, is generously underwritten by Alpine Bank, Nancy and Stephen Dowdle, Carol and Pete Feistman, Laney and Merv Lappin, Jeannie and Dale Mosier, Mary Pat and Keith Rapp. Would you please give everyone a round of applause? We still have a very full calendar of events this winter, and I'd like to give you uh, a few highlights, including tomorrow night. Clay will still be with us, but he'll change his hat from moderator to historian, and he'll bring us back in time to the epic adventures of Lewis and Clark. Uh, we still have tickets available. Don't miss that tomorrow night. Uh, next week on Thursday, we welcome computer science professor Brent Seals to reveal how new technology is enhancing our understanding of ancient documents like Homeric manuscripts and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Later in February, join us to explore the religiosity of UFOs and explore creativity and innovation with a Time Magazine 100 Most Influential People honoree, and that's just February. The complete listing, as you can imagine, can be found at veilsymposium.org. Uh, before we begin, a few bits of housekeeping. Please turn your cell phones to silent, or better yet, turn it off, and enjoy two hours of buzz-free focus. Uh, the program will run until 8 p.m. tonight. Complex issues require a little bit of extra time to get to the bottom of. Uh, and there will be time for questions, so keep your gears turning throughout the program. Tonight is the third installment of a new series for the Vail Symposium, designed to go deeper than the headlines and provide more nuance than the news networks on complex topics. Tonight's program... Uh, oh, sorry, the fourth program. This is the third that we've done. The fourth program is coming up on March 22nd. Clay will be back with us diving into higher education and the culture wars. Uh, these are things like professors getting canceled uh, and students protesting, having speakers come to campus. Uh, if you've read Jonathan Haidt's Coddling of the American Mind, this will be a fascinating uh, program. Our moderator tonight, as you've guessed, is Clay Jenkinson. He's a nationally recognized historian, author, and public humanities scholar with a special interest in Thomas Jefferson and the American Republic. Clay writes books, portrays a number of historical characters. He's done so on Vail stages. He appears in documentary films, including several by Ken Burns, like the most recent one on Benjamin Franklin. Clay edits the National Lewis and Clark Quarterly Journal called We Proceeded On which is why you don't want to miss tomorrow night. He hosts the nationally syndicated radio program and the podcast, The Thomas Jefferson Hour, hosts and moderates Humanities Symposia, and serves as an editor-at-large for the distinguished online journal, Governing.com. Clay is the winner of many awards, including the National Humanities Medal, the highest honor bestowed by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, before I turn it over to Clay, I'd like to recognize our creative collaborator on this specific program this evening, Karen Nold. Can we give Karen a little round of applause? I don't know where she went. There she is. 
Okay, now to introduce our panelists and lead our discussion, please welcome Clay to the stage for this conversation on controversial issues entitled Voting in America, Relax or Reform. Hey ho. So good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, let's have a great evening, spirited conversation, civil discourse, those things that have almost entirely disappeared from American life. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I heard uh, about the upcoming program on the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know about the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? It reminds me of one of my favorite Woody Allen jokes. In one of his essays, he says, in 1948, a penniless Bedouin uh, shepherd was wandering around uh, the Dead Sea, and he found some scrolls in a cave, which in his ignorance he sold to the Cairo Museum for $480,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm from North Dakota, and that, so if I'm a little out of breath up here, it's because of the altitude. Um, today, Dale and Chris took me up to the top of the mountain, and we're at what? 12,000 or 8,000 or some, some gigantic thing. And I'm huffing and puffing and coughing up a lung. And then Dale says to me, so is it Russell or Wittgenstein or Whitehead on epistemology? And I can't even speak. Uh, you know, North Dakota is flat. Perhaps you've heard. Uh, the highest peak in North Dakota is 3,506 feet high. And typically, we establish a base camp at about 2,000 feet. And after three or four days, we make the final ascent. <laughs> and so when I come here, you know, it's like, whoa, uh, rarefied air. So I'm so glad to be here. So I'm going to start with just a little poll. If you just like show hands, you're going to be six, seven questions. How many of you believe that we have a significant voting rights problem in the United States? So you're watching this panelists. Okay. Um, how many of you ever in your life, while trying to vote, have been unduly burdened by inefficiency or some other impediment to your voting? Just look around. Try this in downtown Denver. It'd be a very different poll. How many of you are okay with our extremely diverse and varied individual state voting procedures? Every state has a different system. <laughs> Try that okay one. with it. Okay with this. Okay, the laboratory of democracy. Sorry. Um, how many of you think we need a national comprehensive voting rights and procedures law? Look at that. Amazing. Um, how many of you believe that when you turn up at the polls, the showing of a government issued ID is right and appropriate? Yeah, that's a lot. Okay. Um, how many of you believe that there is significant voter fraud in the United States? <laughs> we, well, yes, we, of course. And how many of you believe we would benefit from a national holiday on voting day? Okay, so the two of you have had a chance to see this. Really interesting, I think. So I'm just going to say a few words and I'm going to introduce our guests. We have so much to cover, I don't want to talk long. I'll just say this. When Thomas Jefferson was elected to the presidency in the year 1800, the population of the United States was 6 million. 6% 6 of those people were eligible to vote. 6% of the 6 million Americans, one in five, was a slave. At that time, were eligible to vote. If you do the math on that, 6% of 6 million, about 250,000 people in a country that's bigger than Europe with an incredibly weak infrastructure of roads, postal systems, communication. About a quarter of a million people in a population of 6 million were entitled by law to vote when Jefferson became president. In the most recent election, the, off, um, the midterm election just passed, of the 340 million Americans, 240 million are eligible to vote. And of those, 66.1% voted, 158 million. So now, 
if 240 to 340 is 70 percent, something like that, 60 percent, um, and that's because you have to be 18 years old to vote in this country. Uh, but 66.1 percent voted 158 million in Jefferson's time, six million. So, as they used to say, we've come a long way in terms of this. But I want to introduce our two extraordinary guests here. I'm just so glad to have them here. Uh, you know, we, we work hard to bring people here who will help clarify these issues, but also have a point of view and love to engage in civil discourse. So we have Aaron Geiger-Smith on my right, your left, lives in New York City, undergraduate UT Austin, law school UT Austin, and a master's in journalism from the Columbia University School of Journalism. She's written for a range of journals, and she has a book which I think very highly of and hope you will buy. Thank you for voting. The maddening, enlightening, inspiring truth about voting in America. Outstanding. Best introduction you can get to this very complicated subject. Doug Spencer is an associate professor of law from nearby University of Colorado at Boulder, where I spent some years myself. He is a Columbia undergraduate. He has a PhD from University of California, Berkeley, and he's a JD in law from the University of California at Berkeley. He's also been a guest professor at Yale and the University of Connecticut. So imagine this, both of them have a Columbia base and my daughter went to Columbia. Uh, and I want to start um, before we get anywhere by asking you about the core. Every Columbia student has to take the, the amazing core curriculum. How was it? Uh, I was just talking to somebody last night about the Columbia core. Um, it's, it was life changing for me. I grew up in a small ish town in Utah. I'd never been to New York City. Uh, I'd never read. Um, the great works, I'd never heard of most of the great works, and there I was thrown into a classroom and uh, my world was uh, expanded and I learned and felt c connected to a larger community and it really changed my life. So Columbia prides itself on this two-year core curriculum that every single student, no matter what their major is, must take. So the Iliad and King Lear and the Divine Comedy and Virginia Woolf and T.S. Eliot and it's outstanding. Most students immediately dislike it until they learn to love it. <laughs> it's you join a group of people who've gone through the same thing, and that's, that helps you power through. <laughs> so, um, James upstairs, or whoever's there, would you point to the first slide here? We're not going to show many. Here are some questions we want to look at tonight. Um, what is the, has the Supreme Court been doing about voting rights? There's an important case coming up. Number two, what should we do about the Electoral College? <clears throat> Number three, is voter suppression real? Number four, do we need a national voter rights and regularity law? Number five, in an age of partisan cable news and Russian trolling, how can we be informed voters? And then second, just four more questions. To what extent do states believe that every eligible person should be able to vote without undue burdens? Can gerrymandering be eliminated? Number three, is it time to initiate voting by smartphone? There were some smirks on that one. <laughs> and how can we restore, quote, the norms in which the loser concedes and there is a peaceful transfer of power? And speaking of that, before I ask Doug the first question, um, James, will you play the video? We have two short clips here, and they will remind you of the chaos of the past. Mr. Gates, I want your reaction to what we just heard. Well, Wolf, thanks for having me. And it's really sad to hear that we have the Republican nominee of governor for governor here in Arizona who's talking like that. I think, you know, the, the votes that were just released, 78,000, that doesn't happen magically. It happens because of the people behind me. All the people here in Maricopa County elections who are working so hard. They're working 14 to 18 hour days every day. We're about to go into a holiday weekend with Veterans Day and they're gonna continue to work those kind of hours on the holiday Friday, 
on Saturday and Sunday. And I understand that Carrie Lake wants us to move quickly, and a lot of people do. But you know what's more important? Is that this is done accurately. That is the focus. And that, you know, like for all of these mail-in ballots, that those are uh, signature verified. This is very important to me as an elected official that only eligible people, only eligible votes are counted. I would think that Carrie Lake would be interested in that as well. That's something that I ran on, on the Board of Supervisors. I support ID at the polls. And all those things, they might take a little bit more time, but it ensures that only those eligible people are voting. So one more slide, if you would push the next one. This is a statement by Margaret Bayard Smith, who was a society correspondent in Washington, D.C., in the age of Thomas Jefferson. And when Jefferson was finally installed as the third president of the United States after 36 ballots in the House of Representatives, and he had his inauguration on the 4th of March, 1801, she was there, and this is what she wrote. It's one of the great statements, and it all makes us a little nostalgic. Let me write to you, my dear Susan, ere that glow of enthusiasm has fled, which now animates my feelings let me congratulate not only you, but all my fellow citizens on the event which will have such an auspicious influence on their political welfare. I have this morning witnessed one of the most interesting scenes a free people can ever witness, the changes of administration, which in every government and in every age have most generally been epochs of confusion, villainy, and bloodshed. In this, our happy country take place without any species of distraction or disorder. Isn't that fabulous? Next slide. <coughs> and there she is, <laughs> Margaret Baird Smith. Um, back, to, back to that, yes, thank you. What a formidable person was. She wrote beautiful diaries and letters throughout her time in the District of Columbia, and she's one of the main sources we have for that extremely interesting and volatile period. So my question for you, Doug, if you'd go two slides forward. How well did we just do in the 2022 midterms? Because in the summer and in the fall, there was widespread belief that there would be chaos, that Carrie Lake wouldn't be the only person uh, rejecting the results, that there might even be street violence. Uh, there might be what Margaret Baird Smith calls an epic of confusion and disruption. How well did we just do? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having us here. It's really, uh, Clay is a remarkable person and it's really a pleasure to share the stage with you. And um, I really appreciate being invited here by the Vail Symposium. Um, <clears throat> I've been studying elections since 2006, um, formally as a graduate student and uh, an academic, I would say. Um, I've observed elections. I've been a formally trained international election observer in Thailand, I was present for the 2000 election in Russia. Um, the United States runs an incredible election operation. Uh, for those who've ever been, had a chance to work on the front lines of an election, whether you've been a poll worker, whether you've just hung around your poll station after you voted for an hour, chatting with friends and watching, um, it's both uh, horrific and inspiring. You can't believe what's happening. There's papers flying everywhere and people are coming in and there's chatting and it's not, it's not robotic. It's not military. You're not standing in the line and saluting to people and being handed your ballot. It's a community event. And we come together as a community in our little precincts and we talk to each other and we smile and we uh, support an idea. And the 2022 midterm election was probably the most secure election the United States has ever administered, ever in our entire Say history. Say that again. Ever, ever administered, this is the most secure election. Now, why do I say that? One is we had more eyeballs on this election than we've had in a long, long time, in part because people like Kerry Lake helpfully, I think, caused people to pay attention. For a long time, we took it for granted that all of this was just going smoothly. And when you take it for granted and then you start to hear whispers, you might say, oh yeah, maybe that did happen. And the whispers of conspiracy take root. We've been hearing about this vast conspiracy. President Donald Trump tweeted that three million people in California would have, would have voted for him, but somehow the votes got lost. Um, and that three million illegal voters voted for Hillary Clinton. 
and these vast conspiracies. You know, I, I tend to laugh, to be honest with you, at uh, the, the theories that our government is so inept and corrupt that they can't even like turn on the lights in their buildings. But they're also so sinister that they can hide massive conspiracies for decades. Mm -hmm. I don't know how those are both true. Either they're amazingly run and they run the secret operation or it's run by human beings. And this election, while being watched, uh, people were voting by mail at a much higher rate. And I acknowledge that mail voting is far less secure than showing up in person. So we had all the recipes for vulnerabilities. Uh, and yet, with eyeballs, auditors, people watching, certifications, Republicans, Democrats, the vote was certified. A peaceful transfer of power happened in the House of Representatives from Democratic control to Republican control. And um, the, the will of the voters was essentially manifest during that election. And to the extent that well, I'm sure we'll hear about this later today, that there are instances where things may have happened here or there. A dozen ballots here, a dozen ballots there. When we're talking about 158 million votes, you could have 10,000 ballots be problematic and we're talking about zero point, add seven zeros and then you get a number. Unless they're all in Georgia. Unless they all are in Georgia and they all skew the same right, way. Right. So there's a lot of assumptions. So let me just interrupt you because I want everyone in the audience to really know that you are a professor. This is your field, one of your fields. And you have a point of view. You have politics. You do, after all, live in Boulder. I, um, live, I live there. But, <laughs> That's true. But you're speaking in an analytical, nonpartisan way about this. 100%. Until, until the evidence is presented in court and accepted by judges, and Carrie Lake points out no evidence was presented. I suspect there's quite a few or some, I, I'm sorry already for you, retired attorneys in the audience. You know how a trial works and evidence was presented, so she's not completely accurate, but a lot of evidence wasn't presented because these cases were dismissed at the very threshold question. Is there even a whisper of a, of a complaint? Is there any claim that's been stated that the court should hear? And the question was, no, this is ridiculous. You're, you're, you're coming with conjecture. So until there's any evidence of systemic fraud, coordinated fraud, um, coordinated conspiracies, I refuse to get caught up in, in the, the narrative about that because what we see with 10,000 different jurisdictions, 2 million poll workers is not the kind of conspiracy that we're hearing about on the media. So let me ask you one last question before I turn to Aaron. Um, Six months ago, if I had interviewed you and said, what do you expect in the 2022 election? Would you have predicted that it would be as smooth and uncontroversial as it turned out to be? Yes. You would have. It has every time. My whole life, the elections have run smoothly. I have no reason to believe otherwise. Our elections have been running smoothly. Smoothly. I mean, Erin's going to problematize this because she's going to talk about the history of some times in our country where we have had um, violence and um, suppression. problems and suppression. But when it comes to administering the elections, this isn't the laws that get passed that prevent people or discourage people. On election day, when people show up to vote, since 1934, when we've really, really been paying close attention, it runs smoothly. And so I had no reason to believe that it would be anything different. People talk a lot, but the election itself was gonna run smoothly. And I wasn't seeing the future. I just, uh, am, it's just how it's been every time. And we saw it again. Thank you for that. So, Aaron, um, again, let me say how much I love this book. Thank and you so it's, much. It's I a, appreciate it's it. It's really terrific because, you know, when you're going to read something, you think, do I want 540 pages of academies on this subject? And the answer is yes, if you're Doug, but the rest of us are, have actual <laughs> lives. And so uh, this is really an outstanding <laughs> introduction to this. Um, and, and a chapter that I particularly loved was your chapter on how to engage young people in voting. We'll maybe come back to that later, but for the moment, can we go two slides forward? How did we get here? Um, you outlined the history of voting in the United States in this book. I know we don't have time for all of that, but give us a little summary of how we got from 6% to 66. Sure. I'm glad to. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here in your beautiful corner of the world. You skied I, today. I did ski. I owe Jeannie Mosier more 
gratitude than could ever be displayed here. And she may never offer to ski with anyone again. We're going to have to ask after, but uh, I had a great time. I heard you uh, had to help her off the mountain. <laughs> she, oh. Somebody was helped on the mountain and we just won't say who it was. Um, I'm going to refer to my notes for this because keeping it down to 10 minutes to describe the history is a difficult and b i get so excited and go into side stories and just want to talk about the history of voting constantly that i'm going to stick to the script uh to be as concise as i tried to be in the book and then we'll move on but um the past of our voting history really informs the present and how things work and how laws are passed currently and what we do and don't do. So I really do think understanding more about our voting history really serves us all well today. Um, when you sit down and really look at our voting rights timelines and the different voting rights fights, there are two kind of undeniable, if simple takeaways. And the first is that we have almost always been a one step forward with voting rights access, two steps back situation, especially in the case of black Americans and other minority groups. And what I mean by that is as soon as there was expansion of access by things like the 15th Amendment or the 1965 Voting Rights Act, immediately people sat down and tried to figure out ways to sort of stall that progress. But the second takeaway is no matter what point in history we were, there were always some Americans, sometimes a few, sometimes many, sometimes even lawmakers, who were pushing for universal, more universal access as we have it today. And I say that because we so often give people in history a pass, oh, they just needed to come around to it, or it just wasn't the time for that. But the truth is there was always someone there pushing for more access and I think my hope in a way is that we want to be the people of history that are, that are pushing to do the right thing and supporting those who are trying to do the right thing. Um, the other thing I always want to highlight when talking about voting rights fact fights is the sheer length that it took different groups to get the right to vote, the just time they had to fight and fight uh, to achieve access to the polls. Um, I'm going to highlight tonight the arc of the women's voting rights and black Americans voting rights. But of course, any conversation about voting rights in the country, one has to point out that unless you were started out as a wealthy white male, you had a long journey to voting rights in this country. And that, of course, includes indigenous Americans and um, immigrant groups, really, of all, all varieties. Um, while by and large it was wealthy white males who had the right to vote at the beginning of the nation, some people are surprised to learn that there were cases where women and free black men could vote even at the beginning of our country. So for instance, in New Jersey, um, until 1807, women had the right to vote. At that point, the constitution was changed to take that right away. And that, so that's a, a step back that I was referring to. Um, also in the 1830s, free black men who had had the vote for a long time obviously saw the tide turning against them. And even though there were very public and reasoned and published pleas by those men to retain their rights to, right to vote, uh, the state, this was in the state of Pennsylvania, that right was stripped away from them in 1838. To move on to the Civil War, um, when of course many black men fought and lost their lives in that war, it was after, during that time period, that the 14th Amendment in 1868 and then the 15th Amendment in 1970 gave black men the right to vote and said past enslavement can no longer be uh, counted against you at the polls. Um, and that was a huge, those were huge, really extremely successful steps in getting black men to vote, and there was just massive expansion and registration of black men all over the South. And it was, the Reconstruction period was really, in many ways, sadly, a high watermark of black representation in the South. So for instance, during that time period, um, a branch of the South Carolina legislature was majority black. We had black, a black U.S. representative. We had a black senator from Mississippi. So it was a really, a time when, things were really flourishing 
but Jim Crow laws really clawed all of that back. Um, and when talking about the success of the 15th Amendment, you also kind of have to look at what it didn't do. So the 15th Amendment didn't um, protect against discrimination for education level or levels of poverty. Um, and those were, of course, the things that Jim Crow laws really targeted and, you know, really took all that progress back. And then, you know, one of the things of pointing to people had the ideas at the time, putting those things in the 15th Amendment was a discussion point at the time. Some lawmakers really pushed for it. And in the end, it wasn't included. Um, and had it been there, we might have not seen things like poll taxes and literacy tests that would keep black Americans from voting in the South all the way until 1965, nearly, uh, nearly a full century later. Um, one other group you might notice was left out of that 15th Amendment was women. At that point in time, the women's suffrage movement had been happening for a full 20 years. So they had been fighting for the right to vote for 20 years. Many women in that group expected to be included in the 15th Amendment and were quite disappointed, to put it mildly, for, it, for that not to happen. Um, it was actually in 1868 that the Susan B. Anthony Amendment that eventually was ratified and gave um, acknowledged women's right to vote. That was actually introduced in 1868 and ratified in 1920. So you might notice that's a giant, you know, a full 50 years later that that took. And during that time period, it was women building on the work of the women before them, lobbying constantly, finding different theories, finding different ways to convince people, bringing their arguments basically to the street. I mean, that's what suffrage parades were, were thousands of people marching in New York and Washington demanding the right to vote. And at the very end of the suffrage movement, I think, and I included before I really dug into this, sort of pictured the women in their long, beautiful skirts, charmingly marching, holding signs. But those marches involved um, real abuse from the crowds, a lot of spitting on, on the women. There were arrests. There were hunger strikes when they were in jail. So at the end, it really was a much non-dainty fight to really um, put that, convince politicians that it was time to make that change. Can I just uh, quickly interrupt? Uh, so 1848, Seneca Falls Convention, one of the great moments in American history, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony rewrote the Declaration of Independence to be more inclusive. And they worked tirelessly, these women, for the emancipation of slaves and for the franchise for black people. They gave themselves to this and there was a kind of expected quid pro quo that they would also get the vote in the 15th Amendment or shortly thereafter. When it didn't happen, the bitterness was extreme. At, at, at that, that time period really exposed bitterness, but also tension between the movements and the, the racism that existed very much in parts of the movement. Um, we don't want to quote it, but some very dark things were said by women to the effect of, if black men can vote, how can it possibly be impossible for white women to vote? And so this was a a source of racial tension that lasted for a very long time. Yes, it, it did. I mean, that's um, definitely one of the more an interesting aspect of suffrage history is that um, tension and also, of course, how many black women were extremely active in the suffrage movement. Um, and then we'll talk in a minute about, you know, black women pushed for that right, but it was really until 1965 in the South that their efforts were, were rewarded. So many of those women didn't actually live to, uh, to get the vote. One, on a more up note, when looking back at the suffrage movement, it's, so, it's sort of a delight to read about the things that they did that would, we'd still be so impressed by today. You know, they created merchandise to be sold um, to support the movement. They had slogans that were essentially made for social media, and they really purposefully took their fights to the street to make people 
really recognize. I always think it's funny we call them suffrage parades because really they were full out suffrage uh, protests. Um, but one other thing that's sort of interesting about that time period and having the 1920 date is that there were major differences state to state on when women could vote. So while 1920 is the nationwide vote, here in the West, many states and territories allowed women to vote much, much earlier. Um, Colorado, of course, in the early 1890s. So it's sort of an example of the different access in states and how it was easy for some people to vote in some states and in impossible in others. And we don't have the impossible standard today, but it is uh, very different. Uh, day to day. So to sort of jump forward from that and tie the two together, as I was alluding to a minute ago, the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote nationwide, but the giant asterisk that that amendment has is that though it did secure the right for white women to vote nationwide, it would be until the Voting Rights Act in 1965 that many black women in the South actually had the right to vote. So again, you look at that giant leap of time from 1920 to 1965, when people who should have been able to vote um, really often were not able to. Uh, so Doug will jump into it a lot more, but it is the Voting Rights Act in 1965 that has been used since then and is still used today to fight discrimi discriminatory uh, voting rights laws. Um, and that might be the racially motivated closing of polling places or uh, in the early days after this, the Voting Rights Act, kind of unfair ways of holding elections um, for even city council and things like that. In 19, I mean, excuse me, in 2013, the Voting Rights Act kind of took a, a major hit as far as its effectiveness in a Supreme Court case called Shelby County. And the outcome of, the, of that case was that states and counties that had documented histories of discrimination had previously had to get federal approval essentially to have new voting laws to make sure they weren't passing laws that would have a discrimina discriminatory effect. And after 2013, they could pass the laws and then they're fought in court. And that's what's happening. In the, and then we'll discuss what the court has even done since 2013. Um, a thing that I think is interesting about this history and how different groups got the right to vote and what voting laws like registration and things like that, why it really matters today is because it does still have we can see the effect of turnout rates on states where it's a little more difficult to register or you have to bring your ID or different things. Those states, unlike Colorado, generally have lower turnout numbers. So it's all of this really ties together. Um, but the other thing that I think is the most interesting and important about our voting rights history is really learning and understanding how many heroes that we had, and I'm happy to go into more detail about them, but we had so many voting rights heroes in our history, and we have so many voting rights heroes today. I'm sure many in your community who are on the ground doing the work to fight for free and fair elections and secure elections. Um, and so heroes then and heroes now, and I'm happy to discuss all of it. I'm glad to jump into the conversation. That was a quick history. I hope I didn't... Very quick. Thank you. So <laughs> just, you to, just to go back to it, just a couple of quick points on this. First of all, Shelby 2013. So uh, Chief Justice um, Roberts wrote the decision, five to four decision. And what it basically did was gut the Voting Rights Act of 1965. When the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed, they knew that some states would do everything in their power to evade it and avoid it. This, this is the history of those states. And so they put in a federal supervision provision that said that until this problem was completely gone, um, the Justice Department would review any state uh, action about elections to make sure that they weren't discriminatory. And this was a very important provision of that. And Justice Roberts said, Essentially, discrimination is over now. We can stop monitoring this. And you have to sort of think, well, what world do you live in, Justice Roberts? But he said, it's over. We don't need to do that anymore. That's an unfair intrusion on state sovereignty since the problem has essentially been solved. And I mean, you must feel that that was badly dis decided. Well, I think it's a complicated story, to be honest. All right, tell us. Um, I think that the language that was used in the law itself s set itself up to be overturned, okay. and so lawyers saw this coming. 
Um, there was a provision, so in, in 1870, the 15th Amendment's ratified, it says you can't discriminate in voting based on color or race. And so creative legislatures in certain parts of the country, now of course these are parts that we're familiar with, and it's mostly the Deep South, but uh, the Deep South is where 90% of the black population in America lives. So it's, it's where there's payoff if you're trying to be political about it in discriminating in a particular way. And there were creative ways to, to prevent black people from voting. First of all, we would say, well, you're free to vote, but you've, you can only, you're only eligible if your grandfather was eligible to vote. And of course, if your grandfather was an enslaved person, that wasn't gonna work. And then that was struck down by a court. But of course, for an election, you didn't get a vote. And so then, they okay, we're sorry about that. And so then they said, well, we're gonna have a literacy test, but it's not gonna be administered as a literacy test. We're gonna ask you to count bubbles on a bar of soap and stuff like that. And so then you file a lawsuit and the state loses because it's discriminatory. But in the meantime, an election has gone by. And this is one of the sad truths about an someone like me. I practiced election law and it's a really difficult area of law to practice. If I practice housing discrimination, and I find out that you've been discriminated against, I get you your apartment back, or I get you your rent back. If you're in employment and you've been discriminated against, I can get you your job back, I can get you your wages. If I find an election discrimination against you, what I promise you as a plaintiff is, the, 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 the city or the state that's discriminated against you will probably put their hands up and say, my bad, but you don't get to redo the election, and you don't get to undo the laws that got passed under that discriminatory election. So there's no remedy. Um, and it's challenging. Um, it's challenging for lawyers because we can't pay bills. We don't get damages and things like that. Um, but there was this cat and mouse game for a hundred years. Okay, after literacy tests, then we'll try poll taxes. After poll taxes, we'll try something else. And so in 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act and it had a whole bunch of different provisions. And the most important one, which has been alluded to, was one section of the act said, if you're a state that has been engaging in this shenanigans for a hundred years, you have to get permission from the federal government before you can change your law. We're not gonna wait for you to change it and then go back and see if it's discriminatory or not. We already played that for a hundred years and we've become wise to that. And so that provision, because it's such a major sovereignty issue to make the federal government tell states what to do, had a, a sunset provision, five years. 1965, they passed, Congress passed the law and said, we will resolve discrimination in voting in five years. Five years came and Congress said, oh, that's not enough. So they extended it another five years. And what they were looking at in deciding which state they were going to use was census data. So they looked at the census and they said, where is turnout between white and black voting or white and Hispanic voting very big? Where is black voting less than 50%? Um, and at the end of the second five-year period, they said, that's not enough. We haven't eliminated racism from American politics. So then they extended it for 12 years. And at the end of 12 years, Ronald Reagan was in office. And he said, we got to extend it even more. A Republican. Republicans controlled the Congress. This wasn't a Democratic ploy. They extended it for 25 years. In 20, 2006, Congress had the chance to extend it again. And this was the problem. When they decided to, to determine which states were going to be subject to this, they didn't update the census data. They were still relying on census data from 1965. What they should have done is said, well, well, let's look at census data from 2006. And so you'll see law professors and legal scholars and lawyers went to Congress when they were evaluating this and said, if you don't update this, the Supreme Court could overturn this law. And sure enough, Congress said, well, we don't know. And the real reason was politics. If they would have updated their data, it would have swept under this preclearance provision, Tennessee. And Bill Frist was a very powerful man in the Senate. And he was like, over my dead body, is my state gonna be subject to this? And so Congress didn't update it. And when it got to the Supreme Court, sure enough, they struck it down. So um, I, I don't think that it's healthy for the hastening of the waning of racism in American politics, that that was struck down. But when the case came before the court, I think the court had a legitimate argument to say, if you will update that formula, you can do that. But you failed to, and they punted it back to Congress. Um, and the only, the, the reason why I think that, that I'm somewhat skeptical is that I think John Roberts knew that Congress wouldn't do anything. And so it wasn't a good faith kicking back to Congress, but it, what the court really did do is they didn't say you can't do this. They said, if you, Congress, will update your, your data, we're fine with this. 
So just one quick comment. This is why we do this. Because we all hear about these things and we have immediate opinions and on the cable news we hear people shouting back and forth. We've just had some clarification by a legal expert about the complexity of this and the court's not just looking at what's right and wrong, the court is looking at the provisions of the act, its extensions, uh, the failure of the demographic review and so on. And so this is what we're trying to do here is to bring clarification to these complicated issues and not just opinionate. So we really appreciate I that. Think, I think one more footnote to that is that in, during the Reagan administration, when the debate of re-upping the Voting Rights Act was happening, there was a lot of behind the scenes of weakening the same provision that was in effect in Shelby County. And there was a young DOJ lawyer who really, really pushed for that language to be weakened. And eventually that lost. And that's when Reagan gave his crown jewel of, you know, voting as a crown jewel speech. But that young DOJ attorney was none other than the current Chief Justice John Roberts. So for a very long time, he had some issues with uh, <coughs> Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, and turns out sometimes young DOJ lawyers become Chief Justices of the Supreme Court and get a chance to I want to ask have their question. opinion Aaron, when the strongest is the word. Question. Can we go to slide 20? Just pushing fast. In role of finding that slide, I'll just note in 2006 when Congress did <coughs> use the old data but re up this. George W. Bush was president, Republicans controlled the Senate, and it passed the Senate 98 to 0. Republicans controlled the House of Representatives, and it passed the House of Representatives 390 to 33. So it had wide support. This wasn't um, a racial entitlement, it wasn't a democratic law. It, it did have wide support, but some people in a specific seats of power have opposed it, and they've been able to impose that will on us. So if you all just look at this chart, uh, I will freely admit that I'm not going to quit my day job to do design, uh, but I made this chart which shows that from the 6% to now where we have up almost 70% of people who are voting, but you see it's, an, it's, it's beautiful that we've expanded in the way that we have. It's a remarkable achievement for a country over time, but you can't accept that at face value, Aaron, because if you take, say, the 15th Amendment, I remember going to school and you hear the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendment and it's a sort of a feel-good story about American progress and justice and so on. But when then you realize that no sooner had the 14th and 15th Amendments been ratified in 1868 and 1870 than southern states began to scheme about how they could basically gut them and void them with black code laws and Jim Crow laws and just to take the idea, say, of the of the literacy tests in some states, they would have a jar filled with beans and they would say, you have to be able to tell us how many beans there are in this jar if you want to vote. And white people would not be asked this question or they would be given the answer. Then the African-American would come and they'd say, how many beans in this jar? And he'd say, or she would say, 182. And they'd say, wrong, you can't vote. And the literacy tests often had people doing advanced algebra and so on. So they were designed to pretend that these were honest um, conditions of voting and they were used in an entirely discriminatory way, not to mention intimidation at the polls and lynching and so on. So when you see a chart like that, you think, wow, America. But you have to do the two steps back, don't you, on all of these questions? Hey, you really do. I mean, it's remarkable where we are. We still have many flaws, but um, yeah, the progress is there just learning what it is. And then I think really one of my takeaways from looking so closely at the voting history, and a lot of it is really tough and doesn't give you um, a lot of pride, <laughs> is that you sort of have to recognize that there really is what I like to call evil creativity in this world of figuring out how to make it the most difficult for people. Um, and that still exists to a certain extent, but we have um, the tools to fight them, even if they are maybe a little more weakened. I'm going to add one footnote to literacy tests. And meanwhile, would you go to uh, slide 25? Go ahead. Um, literacy tests were challenged as violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, that they didn't treat people equally. And the United States Supreme Court said, we don't believe you. 
And so literacy tests in this country as of today are still a constitutional possibility. And the only reason they don't exist is because the Voting Rights Act as a statute eliminated them, said states can't use that tester device. And so that's just one important fact about the Voting Rights Act as we see it being stripped back and back and back is if the Voting Rights Act is struck down, which I do think the court is headed in that direction, there are a lot of downstream effects of that and literacy tests actually are still on the table if that statute gets struck down. And I think that even as late as 1952, the Warren Court affirmed literacy tests yes. in certain states. So this debate is far from over. I just want to read this and I apologize. This is very upsetting but this is Pitchfork Ben Tillman of South Carolina. I think it's fair to say one of the most racist members in the history of the United States Senate, frequently at odds with Theodore Roosevelt. But this is what he said around 1910, and I apologize in advance. I'm not gonna use the word, um, but you'll see. We did not disenfranchise the N until 1895. Then we had a constitutional convention in South Carolina convened, which took the matter up calmly, deliberately, and avowedly with the purpose of disenfranchising as many of them as we could under the 14th and 15th Amendments. There it is in plain English. Now, there's no hiding. We adopted the educational qualification as the only means left to us, and as the N is as contented and as prosperous and as well protected in South Carolina today as any state in the Union south of the Potomac. He is not meddling with politics, for he found that the more he meddled with them, the worse off he got. As to his rights, air quotes, I will not discuss them now, and this is the most chilling of all the sentences in this. We of the South have never recognized the right of the end to govern white men, and we never will. I would to God the last one of them was in Africa and that none of them had ever been brought to our shores. That's extreme, but it's not unique by any means. And if you just sort of parse that, here is the South that has benefited in unbelievable ways economically from slavery. And now he's saying, we would, I wish they had never come here at all. Uh, you realize how deep the racial divide has been in American history, dating right from the beginning, and how honest and candid certain people have been. I was astonished when I found this quotation but it's by no means unique, and it's not entirely over yet. I just want to go to the next slide for just a moment. Um, here we have the civil rights era, uh, and one more. Remember, some of you are old enough to remember all of this. It shaped your lives, I think. So let's go to issue number three here. Voter suppression laws, this comes right out of this. So. I, I want to play Rick Hassan, is that right? Uh, Rick Hassan. Hassan. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> of UCA Law. I got to interview him, thank you, Karen, uh, back in November, and we had a wonderful interview, and I asked him about voter suppression laws, and I think you're going to be surprised at this discussion, so let's play that clip. I think that some of these laws are being passed with the intent to suppress the vote, they often don't have that, that intent. They often don't have that effect, I should say, even if they have that intent. Uh, part of the reason they don't have that effect is because these laws create a backlash. So, for example, a state passes a strict voter identification law, then voting groups put in efforts to make sure that everyone gets those uh, correct, uh, you know, uh, um, forms of identification. Uh, that doesn't make them justified. I would look at the level of each voter and ask, is there a reason the state is putting a stumbling block in front of voters? Is it really preventing an appreciable amount of fraud? And voter ID laws don't seem to stop a whole bunch of fraud. All right, so I think you all could hear that. Uh, this is just one of, of a number of, of clips we took from that extraordinary interview. And he's eminent in his field, um, frequently on, on major media, I think CNN. Uh, and we were very fortunate, and again, thanks to Karen, that we were able to have these interviews. We do these pre-interviews so I can learn and we can all learn about these subjects. And uh, it's amazing. I think you can all feel great pride in this, that just saying Vail Symposium has a wonderful effect on people all over the country. We've talked these two in coming here, for example. 
Um, it's an amazing thing, and people, people feel respect automatically for what you're doing here with the Veil Symposium. And so that makes our life, my life, so much easier. And we will get to your questions here shortly, so be thinking of your questions, and I hope, James, you will give me a sign when it's about time. Uh, but let me turn to the next slide for just a second. Kind of most absurd <laughs> case, right? In the Georgia law, um, now illegal to distribute water. And you were explaining this to me a little while ago, Doug. What's the rationale if you have to have one for this? Well, I would say there's a, a more nefarious rationale and then maybe a more benign rationale. Right. The more nefarious rationale is where we had creative grandfather tests, literacy tests, poll taxes, this and that. Now, creative evil, as, 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 the, as you the, put the, it there. The creative um, evil, yes. Yeah. So the, you, there's creativity in finding ways to make it challenging to vote. The concern about pr not providing aid, I, part of this was the Democrats said, we can't provide water. It doesn't say in the law you can't provide water, but it does say you can't provide aid to people standing in line. Uh, and the con so chairs, you know, you come to vote, you stand there, you do, you do you your business. You can't provide a chair. You can't provide a chair. That's aid. That's aid. And the concern is that the parties will, or the candidates will go stand in line and say, I'm just helping the voter. Let me help you vote. By the way, my name's Doug Spencer, and I would really like to help you get up to the polling place because I'm a nice guy. And if you happen to see the name Doug Spencer on that ballot, <laughs> I got your back. They're just worried about electioneering happening in a more subtle way than people holding signs, that campaigns would be the ones providing water, not civic groups. And so the state and, and this about can that. happen. It, it, it can happen. Yes. In fact, uh, there's some debate in the, under a federal law. You can't provide any kind of prize for voting. Now it's obvious you couldn't pay somebody for voting a certain way. That's a bribe. But there's been a question: Can I pay you just to show up to vote? And the answer is no. In a federal election, you can't have pizza at the polling place. You can't have a potluck afterwards. We have to get a special exception to that law so you can get an I vote sticker. Because an I vote sticker is something that of value. They had to get an exception for Exception, this? because it's something of value. And you can't give people something of value to vote. We're all feeling better now because <laughs> I've had these stickers. You are a special person. <laughs> well, I knew that. But you can, you, you can provide aid at a, at a state election. And okay, so, not federal. but not a federal election. So if there are state ballots, then you can provide. And so people would provide water or pizza or donuts. And then campaigns say, hey, this is a, I think it makes sense. If I'm running a campaign, of course, I'm going to send people to the line. And they were worried about that. And so you said there was a nefarious and an innocent. And the nefarious is this just adds to another burden that's been put on voting that disproportionately affects more marginalized groups because there are no long lines, probably, at most precincts in Vail. There are long lines in precincts in Denver. There are long lines at precincts uh, in, in New York City. Milwaukee, Chicago. Milwaukee. You know. And those places also Atlanta. happen to be demographically um, the kinds of groups who have been discriminated against. So in a vacuum, a voter ID law makes sense. In a vacuum, no water might make sense. It's when you link that to the history that some people say, I feel like I've seen this game before and it's making me uncomfortable. But so, Aaron, when I, when I was sort of thinking about this eight or nine months ago, all of the um, information you get from the left side of the spectrum is that these are vicious, racist uh, voter suppression laws and they work. But in your book, you say, well, they may have suppressive intent, but it's not you. I think you agree with Professor Hassan that they don't necessarily work. Yes, I, th I mean, I think the answer is yes and no. Sometimes what they do is a new, as he said, a new voter ID law will be passed or a, a, a law like this in Georgia that becomes publicized and it can motiv motivate people to come out to show you're not going to stop me from voting. It also motivates um, get out the vote groups to educate people better. And, you know, so those things can kind of come head to head and hopefully it actually works in the higher turnout but but it doesn't always necessarily so in texas for instance has a very strict voter id law and one of those rules in it is that uh, college students can't use their student id now you can use your hunting license but you can't use your student id you can use your hunting license correct so there's it, it's a it's there's some interesting facets in the Texas voting ID law, but like that that law in particular affects students, um, younger people and people of color and 
older people are less likely to have a state-issued driver's license and so have to default to, to some of the others. Texas does have a much lower voter, voter turnout rate than states that don't have those laws. So sometimes they work, sometimes they doesn't, don't. The other thing, though, that I like to point out about these sorts of laws that lead to lawsuits and resources having to be shifted around, what I think they do that's the most detrimental is take away resources that can better be used to just get everyone registered to vote and using money and time to actually educate voters and get out the vote. So what laws that become controversial like this do is really take away resources that could much better be used for other things because none of them so far have been shown to actually reduce what is the concern of these passing, which is voter fraud. But because we actually have so little voter fraud, you're passing laws to stop a problem that doesn't really exist. Let me just play the devil's advocate for a moment, because if you watch, say, Fox or any conservative media, they will say, these are not voter suppression laws. These are voter security laws. And it is reasonable to say we don't want anyone proselytizing in the line. We don't want... Uh, we, we want to make sure everyone has a bona fide ID so we know who's voting. Uh, we don't, you know, there are things that we feel are maybe not producing fraud, but are capable of producing fraud. And we're just tightening the laws right. to make this more secure so that every American can feel confident in the and vote. And I which should say, you know, it sounds very fair. Voter ID laws are something, I mean, many of you said that it sounds like a reasonable thing, and it does. We have to show an ID to, in New York City, I, there is not a building I can, you know, a, a corporate office I can go in without showing an ID. You can't pick up a FedEx package without an ID. It seems like something very easy to do, and it is easy for most of us who have a driver's license or who have a state-issued ID. But what that, the people the voter ID laws hurt are the poorest in our country, the, the oldest, and the youngest. And so maybe it is only, I, there was a study in Texas that said it impacted 4% of would-be voters in Texas. Well, that's a lot of people. You know, that's in Texas, I believe it was almost 200,000 people. And so we can profile it's, that population. I mean, it's cor not correct. And so while it does affect a very small amount of people, if you want and believe everyone should be able to vote with reasonable ease, things like that do matter. So it's all, I mean, the main point of all of this discussion, I think, is when you see a voting law being passed, really think, who is this going to affect and what problem is it going to solve? If I could add a couple of things. One, um, we don't have a fundamental right to enter corporate buildings. So, yeah, right? absolutely. And so there, the, the analogy that people say, well, I need an ID to do these things. A lot of the things you need an ID to do, get on an airplane, are privileges, um, not fundamental rights. So it's, it's worth thinking about that. But I, I think there's an analogy from the criminal justice system in the United States. We have this idea. I don't know if it's actually true, but it's an idea I think all of you have heard. It's better that a guilty person goes free than that we put an innocent person in prison. And so we've built up all of these laws of evidence and laws in a courtroom to protect um, people who've been accused of a crime. You're innocent until proven guilty. And what happens if a bad guy gets off? Well, we're okay with that as a society because we've built this structure to make sure that no good guys wrongfully go to jail. And when it comes to voting, we, have, we also have a security problem and the question is, do we want to make the rules so secure so that no bad guy ever votes, no ineligible person ever votes, at the expense that some people who do have that right because they're citizens and they've been raised in this country and they deserve to vote, don't get to because we've made these really strict rules? Or do we say, we are so committed to anybody who was born here, has their God-given right to vote and participate, no taxation without representation, whatever slogan you want to throw out there, recognizing that that might mean some people who shouldn't have voted made it in the system. Um, and so how tightly we squeeze that security, we don't have a general idea about voting, a consensus. There is a consensus, at least at a theoretical level in criminal justice. We've never come to that same consensus when it comes to voting. And I see the conservative and liberal debates mirroring that idea I want more security and then the liberals say, well, you're cutting people off. 
And we want to let everybody in the conservative state, well, you're letting in people who shouldn't. They're both right. We have to decide what we want. So 158 million votes cast just recently, not to mention state and local elections and so on. Asking each of you very briefly, how much voter fraud is there in this country and how seriously should we be concerned about it? You first. I would, I would spend my sleepless nights on other things. Not much. <laughs> I would not worry about voter fraud. If, yes, I, I don't even want to go into it because I just wouldn't worry about it. Eric? <laughs> I have very little. There's just, it happens often when it happens, the person is caught and it, we have very stiff penalties. I mean, you're really taking a risk if you decide to commit voter fraud. You can go, you know, you can literally go to jail for many years. So it's. And it um, goes in both political yeah, directions. And, and honestly, may, it might be easy for me to put in a hat and go in twice. I mean, it's not really easy. I'm likely to get caught. But in a vast conspiracy, especially by the way that our elections are held, with we have so many precincts. I mean, just pulling off true election fraud would take a genius that I frankly don't think exists. The Heritage Foundation made a database of all election fraud. And there, I think, if you're a conservative, you believe what Heritage is putting out. They're a respectable, um, kind of academically tinged conservative um, think tank. And they picked up this idea of voter fraud because their chief election person is this gentleman, Hans von Spakovsky. He used to work in the voting section of the DOJ. And he, this is his hobby horse, there's voter fraud. So if, I, I, if, if I'm into voter fraud, I'm going to Hans. And he helped manage this database. And they looked between 1990 and 2014, and they cataloged every bit of voter fraud they could find. And they published this so that everyone would finally see how much voter fraud there was. Because every, every found out bit. Every, well, they didn't just do every found out, they, every credible allegation of voter fraud. And okay. they came up with 156 in 20 years. 156 individuals, individuals. in 20 years. All right, so I just want to be devil's advocate in a bigger way for a moment. Um, if I were a conservative person in this audience, I would be thinking, here they go, a bunch of liberals up there talking. You got a New York City woman who's a writer and you got a Boulder professor and they're trotting out all this liberal yeah. stuff. What about my small town Texas roots? I You're feel, both small I feel towns, attacked. So, but, but you take my point that, that the, the arguments that you're making are perceived on the right to be self-serving liberal arguments. And so this creates a problem because if you're, if you're telling the truth and we assume you are, then they're barking up the wrong tree but they believe that there is more voter fraud than you're saying. They believe that we do need voter security laws. And it's not as if they're just doing it for naked partisan reasons. Some are, but many are genuinely concerned about this question. So how can we create a system of confidence in our voting so that this ceases to be an issue which you both regard as a negligible issue? I mean, number one, if I think if someone had had the answer to that question, we would have presented it about five years ago. That's why and, we bring but, but the number one, I think we have to figure out a way to turn down the temperature. Number two, I think, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I am a writer. I wrote this book, but my job is I'm a reporter. I'm, I'm a journalist. So I will go to the grave saying, find the credible news sources that's, exist in your area and start there. And hopefully the more you read, the more you trust. I mean, I understand that that has become a uh, scary talking point too. But honestly, the truth is it's hard because it is very difficult to prove a negative. And the best we can do is present these facts as they exist, deal with theories as they come up, but the truth is, I think people have done a really good job of disproving these theories and we're just not doing the best job in the media included breaking through and we just have to keep, keep working at it and being as honest as we can. I mean, I, I will be honest that I have, when I was writing this book, I have, I'm from a tiny town in Texas, which voted over 70%. Um, for Trump and my own aunt was very concerned about mail-in voting and believed all the theory. I mean, she just did. And, and the best that I could say to her was 
I haven't lied to you in 40 years. Why would mail-in voting be the hill, hill I die on here? <laughs> like I, you know, I mean it sincerely. And I would say that not just to my aunt, but everybody else. Did We're, you convince her? It, we, I, it, I hoped I did, and then it became a, an agree to disagree because it's difficult. And uh, she, you know, I, I really, I was like, I haven't lied to you ever. <laughs> I'm not going to start now. <laughs> what, uh, Doug, what about not, so we had a little meeting upstairs for those who wished who came early, and I really want to do that in the future. I love it when you come in and make your own suggestions. And one of the persons said, well, what about this non-official suppression of vigilantes with AR-15 standing around voting lines and intimidating people that they don't want voting and this increasing kind of pressure campaign that you're seeing in polling places, in the back room during the counting of votes and out on the lines. What, what's the answer to that? Um, one, I, I think, one is a psychological uh, experiment for people to do in their own lives and to just sit down and, and accept that the, the people that you like and the party that you support will probably lose half the time. Uh, and you just need to accept that. Whether you're a Democrat and you just get upset when Republicans win or if you're a Republican and you wish Trump was your president until the day you died. It's just not going to happen. Um, it changes. We take to, our country is enormously diverse. We don't have a shared ethnicity. We don't have a shared language. We, it's mostly English. It's changing. We don't have the shared kind of things other countries have, a national religion. What we share is a, is a democracy, and we take turns pulling the levers of government. And we have to accept that as a fact. Um, so that's one, is just to internalize the fact that sometimes I'm going to lose. That way, when that happens and it stings, I don't immediately start saying, well, something must be wrong because my party lost. Oh, yeah, I remember. This happens. I can handle it. <laughs> and then go back out. The second thing I would say is, you, don't, you know who's not calling about conspiracies? Election poll, poll workers and judges, Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. If you really think there's systema, systematic fraud, don't trust whatever reporter benefits from getting likes and advertisers by saying outrageous things. Go find out for yourself. Go volunteer to polling station, watch it happen. Do that for an election or two. And you, you don't have to live in the place where you're a poll worker. So if you're like, well, Vail's safe. I'm going to go up to Michigan because that's where it happens. Fly to Michigan. Rent a place there for a month. Say, I want to be a poll worker. They would love to have you. There's a shortage of poll workers. And watch it. And go in that back room and watch them slide those ballots through. It will cure you of this fear that there's the, the exposure to this happening. This is why I started by saying I've watched this for a long time. And so seeing it firsthand, I can say it's not broken. But I want to ask the same question again. You know, okay, so there's a law that prevents people from offering water at a poll site, but in some states there's no law that prevents someone in camos with an AR-15 from standing around that same line. There are, in every state there's laws that prevent voter intimidation, and right. the challenge is find, getting those incidences reported and then enforced by having police come and, and intervene in a particular way. Um, and so that does happen. I would say it's very rare. It doesn't make it okay. You think it's rare, this intimidation? I think the intimidation is rare. Um, and it needs to be stamped out where it happens. Um, but it's, it's rare, and there are laws to, in, in, to enforce it. Um, they just need to be found more quickly. Let's go to uh, slide 34. We're going to jump forward, and then we're going to take your questions. So just quickly, simple topic, gerrymandering. <laughs> Um, first of all, gerrymandering, let's go to the next slide. That's the original cartoon. So Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts was governor and he allowed this redistricting to occur and it was seen as corrupt. And when the cartoonist looked at the map of Massachusetts and how this district had been drawn, it looked a little bit like a salamander. And so the cartoonist said, this is gerrymandering rather than salamandering. And it's really Gary, not Jerry, but we'll say gerrymandering because that's the common spelling. It's a marvelous cartoon. Let's go to the next one. We can quote Aaron. Gerrymandering is drawing boundaries of an electoral district to the benefit of a party or class. So some states allow the majority in the legislature to determine redistricting, which is required by law every 10 years. Some states have independent commissions, Colorado. 
Some states have a kind of a hybrid system. Uh, some states allow the governor to appoint a commission. What's the answer to the problem of gerrymandering? Is this getting a huge amount of press? Start with Aaron. What's the answer? Yeah. <laughs> How much time did you say we had? You got one minute. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think we can't deny that there are some states where the lines every 10, 10 years are drawn in ways that benefit whichever party is in power. Texas, for instance, is a real talent for gerrymandering. And then my home state of New York, the Democrats in New York just really went for it recently and it came back it to bite off. them badly um, when, their court, when their maps were thrown out and you have George Santos to, <laughs> to thank for all of those things. I, I like the idea of the independent commission. I think that in my ideal world, you use the technology we have to draw the maps as equal as you can get them. But as I think Doug will say, it's not so easy to decide. And do you want to group like together? Do you want to make competitive districts? It is not an, an easy question, but I personally do, do like the idea of taking it out of the hands of state legislatures because people in power like to keep it and it's gone on forever and will happen forever as long as the people hoping to get elected get to draw the districts for which they want to be so elected. So both parties engage in it and both parties are a little reluctant to give it up because I think pretty soon we'll be in the majority, we'll redraw, we'll be in power for the next 50 years. So how do, first of all, a historical note, how in a state like Colorado, do, do the people wrest this abusive power away from the legislature and put it into a commission? At the right time when your state's moving from one major party to the next, and you're in this purple phase, like we were in Colorado for four to eight years. When we were, we were red until 08, went for Obama, and we've been trending blue. And in that window, you know, there was a space to, to rest this away. And it actually didn't come from the citizens. The legislature created it, and then the citizens ratified it, which is different. In some states, the legislature says, no way, and the states use a ballot initiative to take that power away. Um, I do think that it's time for us to relax the relationship between geography and voting preference. We have this very, very strong view that if we live in a particular place, we must share all of the ideas with someone in our same neighborhood. And so we draw districts in particular ways that keeps us together by geography, even though we might share our values with uh, something that's not geography. We might share our values with people who we go, who belong to our same church. Uh, or somebody who belongs to our same race, or somebody whose ancestors came from the same place. And so one way to think about that is that in, uh, I'm going I'm to flood, I think it's 19, 1841, excuse me, there's a requirement in federal law that congressional districts be single member districts. And that doesn't have to be the case. And I think if we had larger districts, and you could elect two or three people within each of those districts, then you couldn't manufacture the kind of gerrymandering we could now, and it wouldn't be a major reform. And within each of those districts, different groups could mobilize. You wouldn't guarantee a community a representative, but if they chose to mobilize within that larger community and they get one in three shots, if you're 30%, you might get a representative. So a third party could emerge. A racial minority group could, cope cohesive, could become cohesive. Um, uh, abortion rights or abortion uh, or pro-life groups could mobilize and get somebody. It would add more diversity in terms of the people we elect with one change, which would just be relaxing geography slightly and allowing us to elect more than one person from within each district. So what's better than Congress and even bigger Congress? Uh, we can um, keep the same numbers, but yes, I hear you. You're so, <laughs> you know, IBM computers beat the world's chess champion. <laughs> IBM computers won a Jeopardy, which is actually harder. Uh, truly, because if you think of how Jeopardy works, I'm naive. I think, why don't we put this to a supercomputer and say we want to refigure the system for the country to create as many competitive districts as we possibly can, push send. <laughs> and I think you're going to beat up on that. Absolutely. I'm going to beat up on that. Um, here's what computers can do for us. They can help us make informed choices, but they can't make those choices for us. This is a decision that humans have to make. What a computer can do is it can generate every possible configuration of a map given certain rules. So you tell a computer, I want all the districts to be contiguous. 
I can't have District 1 have, th have three islands. Like the gerrymander. Like system. the gerrymander. They all have to be in one space. A, a cluster. And then I can also tell, I need each district to have the same number of population. And I need my district to uh, be competitive or not competitive. You tell it ru the rules, and then it will give you every possible way to draw that uh, districts. It could be billions and billions of districts in Colorado. And so <laughs> then you that look. That is not true. It's billions true. and billions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's maybe a hundred. No, 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 no. no. It's, billions. It's, it's actually millions. more billions. Billions at least. A computer can't calculate it is actually the, the response. So math, mathematicians are helping us find a billion maps <laughs> that are representative of the quintillions of maps that you could draw. So computers get big. Here, but here's what you get. You get a distribution that says, okay, of all these billions of maps, how many seats do Democrats usually get? And I can tell you. In, in all these maps, how many seats do Hispanic populations usually get? And I can tell you. And then I have to make a choice as a human. And if I don't like that distribution, then I need to change the rules. But the computer can't tell me what's fair. It can just tell me what the world would look like given a set of rules that I tell it and the geography of my state. And that's helpful information. I hope we use that information, but there's no clicking send. You just say, give me a fair district and hope that we get the answer. All right, so Aaron, one last quick question and then we're gonna to go to the audience. So I think you've written that one of the interesting phenomena of our times is that people are picking up and moving to like-minded political places. So they cluster in Texas if they're red, people move to California or Massachusetts if they're blue, that this is a recent migratory trend in American life, the kind of clustering of like-minded people. I mean, it, it is a thing that people talk about with gerrymandering a lot of like people are living more and more together and we're becoming more locally it, homogenous. Lo and our political beliefs are something that we carry more as a specific characteristic. So that's why you say New York City is very liberal and that is true in, your, in their voting. And my hometown of Liberty is a very red part and that's true in their voting. And it, it's a thing that, you know, I, I'm not sure honestly how much of a phenomenon that is as much as it's just part of um our increased politic a symptom of our increased politicization i'm not saying uh, that word is politicization politicization um <laughs> so but you know i think one of the things you talked about earlier was uh one way to tell whether a state is uh, a group is like likely to vote red or blue is if they're closer to a Cracker Barrel or a Whole Foods, and that's been something it's that true. people it's it, it has turned out to be true that if when you look at the data you can you can tell um, how a particular <laughs> district might vote based on that so particular like you don't data need a point. choices there. It's one choice. Whole Foods. How far to your local Cracker Whole Foods? Yeah. I'm from North Dakota. We're Cracker Barrel. Yeah. Uh, let's do some questions. So if you have a question. Raise your hand, make it brief, please, and we'll take as many as we possibly can. So go ahead. I just want to say thank you for that. That was really wonderful, and I trust that it got the gears turning. I see hands. I love it. Uh, to alleviate fears, do we need a national voter ID system backed up by a national register, uh, much like, say, the Social Security system? Do we need a national voter ID system, maybe with retina scan, some sort of super secure voter ID? Um, I, if we're going to require voter ID, then one, I wish that we would make those IDs available to people for free or cheap. Like it's not the, it's not the act of showing the ID that's controversial. It's the method of receiving that. And so having a national standard for what would be on that ID so that we don't end up in some states you can use a concealed weapons permit and in other states you can't and in some states you use a driver's license, but it has to not be expired and in other states you can use it if it's expired and it becomes complicated. I'd like the idea uh, of, 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 of if we're going to nationalize something, a uniform ID, a voter ID that's made available to people makes sense to me. And I think it would, it, it would, it would, I think it would contribute to confidence in the system, but I'm also cynical enough to know that parties are going to make arguments to get people riled up. And the, the counterpoint to that argument is now the government's got your name in a database with everybody else. And I'm scared of that. So it's not a silver bullet, but in my opinion, that would be a move in the right direction. That's Just a compromise I think is worth one quick thought about that in North Dakota, for example, we have a large native American population and they needed IDs to vote, 
and they don't often have the right kind of ID. And the ID requirement was that they have their mailing address or post office box. Many Native Americans don't have post office boxes. And so they are effectively disenfranchised. And about eight years ago, Heidi Heitkamp, one of the candidates, went on a massive campaign to sign Native Americans up so they could get bona fide IDs. But this is an example of how we all take it for granted. How hard is that? But in fact, for many Americans, especially the poor and the isolated in rural places, it's hard to get an ID and expensive and time consuming. And so it's not an equal playing field. And that's, I think, the point that you're making. Uh, yes. Electoral College. Electoral College. Yes, we, it was that on was our list. You were very, I was trying to say, that was very, the most concise question I've ever had, ever. Was there a question mark? So, Aaron, Electoral College. So, uh, you know, the, there are many people that say the Electoral College has run its course. Give us some analysis. I mean, do I think the Electoral College has run its course? Yes, probably. You know, when it was created, it was very difficult for the electoral representatives to travel. It was difficult for the vote counts to get anywhere. I mean, it was created at a time when actually counting the votes of the individual people was really difficult. So you needed to send your representative to Washington. Um, now we are able to count the votes and tabulate them pretty quickly. I mean, we get really upset when it doesn't happen by close of business 9 p.m. on election day. So we don't, do we really need it? No. Do some people really still love it because it gives their state much greater power in presidential elections? Yes. Is it very difficult to change? Absolutely. So it's one of those things that I love the intellectual debate about, but I think we're kind of stuck with it for a while. But I'll let you talk about the sort of the movements to there are, to there work around some, it. There are some workarounds. Amending the U.S. Constitution is probably a non-starter. It just takes too much uh, consensus. Um, but there is a move, maybe you've heard about the National Voter Interstate Compact. Uh, I think Colorado has signed on to this. Um, and it's, they need 270 votes to kick in. And they're at 220 or something, I think I just looked. That's getting close. There are certainly many questions about the efficacy of that in practice and how it would be enforceable if some state decided to get cold feet at the last second. We couldn't enforce that against you know, California or something. And so there's concerns, but there are, there are thoughts about how can we work within the system to beat the system, which by the way is what the Electoral College is about. Um, you know, there, uh, there's concern, or there, was, there was complaints among Democrats, obviously in 2000, Obviously, in 2016, the Democrat got more votes. And what I would say is, yes, Hillary Clinton earned more votes than Donald Trump, but Donald Trump wasn't trying to get more votes than her. He was trying to win the Electoral College. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to, to make apples and oranges when you look back in history. Al Gore wasn't trying to win the most votes. He was trying to win the Electoral College. He happened to get the most votes. And so it would change the dynamics of our politics. We wouldn't go to the same three states that happened to be the turning points at 270. Um, but actual getting it to change, I don't, I don't see that it's going to happen. It's going to take three or four strong Republican states to sign on to this compact for that to get anywhere. Um, and, it, and I think either it will take a Republican winning the majority vote and losing, which could happen. We might laugh because the last two times it happened for a Democrat, but I'll just point out, uh, the Republicans got far more votes in the 2022 midterm election than the seats that they got. And so it doesn't always cut in favor of Democrats. And maybe once Republicans get stung once, they'll say, oh, you know what, we're ready to bargain. And that's a chance maybe we could get an, an amendment. But I, you know, a lot of Americans don't, I think, fully understand that that's the way it works. This is, these are our monopoly rules, like them or not, that the Electoral College decides the popular vote doesn't. So if Mrs. Clinton got 2.9 million more votes than Trump, that raises some eyebrows. If, if she'd had 17 million more votes than Trump, now you have a crisis, right? At some point, this becomes untenable, that the idea of democracy is that the people decide. And I think there's increasing frustration about those gaps. You say it could go either way, but, but I think that Americans are gonna demand some sort of adjustment so that the popular vote is, it cannot be so skewed from the 
electoral. Yes, and no. we've. Sh oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say they're going to demand it, but they're going to need a longer memory because it, it's really people get really up in arms at one. If we get to three, I think that's when people three in a row. That's when people get upset, but you know, because it didn't happen two times in a row, I, I, the difference now in discussion about electoral college versus the discussion in 2020 Very is huge. Yeah, so I, I do think we could get to a point where people find it untenable, but They'll I think it's going to take multiple and, elections. And, well, and one, one final thing, because it's important to note that our country has changed since we created the electoral college. And so it's easy to say, well, we had this really strong commitment towards states' rights. And it's not just change like, oh, we believe that the popular person should win because it makes sense to us. The 17th Amendment is a great example. Before the 17th Amendment, which was ratified in 1911, state legislatures appointed the senators that went to Washington, D.C. And that was the state making that choice. And then we changed as a country. We said, actually, we want pop the popular election to make these choices. And so now we popularly elect senators. That changes the nature of what it means to have states' rights. And so we haven't changed electoral college yet, but just saying the person who wins the most votes should win isn't just a cute rhetorical, you know, bumper sticker. Our whole country has moved in a direction towards democratic decision making in a way that ra should raise questions about the electoral college. We do make choices by, by m mass popular vote with this one exception, and we maybe need, we're trying. We need to move on, but just one more thought about that. The founding fathers were uh, pretty skeptical about democracy. And the Electoral College in some part was meant to be a barrier, a hedge between the people and their choice. And the Founding Fathers thought, well, maybe sometime the people will make a really bad, dumb choice. And some monster, some demagogue, some person who's going to ruin the country. And then the Electoral College could step in between the people and their choice and say, no way, we're not giving it to Burr. We're giving it to Jefferson. And so yes. it was an anti-democratic hedge. And as you say, we've moved way beyond that it and the we have primaries primaries used to be internal party apparatus and now we'll open it up to the public so we've moved James, that direction we're, we'll get to all of you i promise hey thank you very much um you know i see in 1868 you say citizenship or it says citizenship is guaranteed to all persons um but born voting, born or naturalized yes. birth birthright right. citizenship and naturalization um, but uh, voting is not guaranteed to all people, but specifically people under the age of 18. When, when was that guaranteed or was that made a right that you had to be 18 or older? And then is that an appropriate age, do you think, or could it be less than that? That, yes. that was also by constitutional amendment. Um, if and, you go to but, slide 16, please. Yeah. <laughs> Not a, that's it's a very recent. Is it 1970 uh, or 72? 71. 71. There you go, right there in the middle. So there you um, see where there are four amendments that have affected voting in yeah. American history. Which you'll notice that time period was a time when 18-year-olds were being sent to war and not that thrilled about it. Um, and that is a time period where if you know you're old enough to to buy a beer, you can vote. If you're old enough to go to war, you can vote. Um, and that that was a push from 18-year-olds that gathered a lot of support, especially from politicians who thought they could win the vote of 18 year olds. So it was a, um, so that's how that came about. Is 18 the right age? Um, you know, I mostly think so. I think that that's right. I think that there are, um, there are some really viable arguments that that age should be lowered to 16. And maybe some of you have teenagers think that's insane. And some of you think, yeah. Um, but 16 year olds are very affected and consider themselves very affected by laws that are made, especially if you talk to young people right now, no matter the party affiliation, they care a lot about gun violence and they'd like to have a say on, on that issue. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I see the argument for 16, um, you know, 16 year olds are in high school and you can help develop a, a habit earlier by part, yeah. making it part of their civic education. 18 is a weird phase when you're kind of in the nether, you're going to college, you're getting a job, you're out of school. So your social structure that might build you up into becoming a citizen in that one moment, the argument has been made that's that you're losing you're people through the voter. cracks of becoming a voter. Um, and uh, let me just point out, because Aaron raised this really great point, 18-year-olds were being shipped off to Vietnam, and it became a big rallying cry. If you look at 1920, women were, had a big impact in World War I. 
were called to serve their country and said, hey, if I can serve my country, that was part of the suffragist movement at the end. 1870, black men fought in the Civil War. And so, you know, there's this, it's a rhetorical piece. There's nothing that guarantees you a right to vote. Why did we get people who didn't have property able to vote? They fought in the Revolutionary War. And so there has been some, you know, we've been able to use these conflicts and you can point to, I'm doing the civic duty over here, why shouldn't I vote? That quite hasn't happened for 16 or 14 year olds quite yet, and that might be able to push them over the edge, but we're not there. Yeah. Just I quick, sh uh, but as one, one, sorry, one point, because I love this, is that in many states, and I, I believe in, in Colorado as well, you can pre-register 16 and 17 year olds to vote, so that's a way to catch them in high school, um, and that's something that many states do and is really important. So, so they're ready to go at 18. So before 1971, could someone younger than 18 vote or were they not? No. 21. 21. 21. 21. Oh. Yeah. And that was established, uh, I think, in the original... 42. 1942 it was finally codified because, it was codified. Of, because of conscription into... Conscription was, changed, was changed from 21 to 18 in 1942, but it was 21 at that time, which was then universally regarded as the threshold of adulthood. And so once you've allowed conscription to 18, the sort of the handwriting is on the wall. And the here. law before then just said adult, and right. 21 had been the legal definition of adult. Yes. I just want to make a quick statement before I ask this question. I was involved in about 20 to 30 campaigns since 1964, and I never saw any instance of fraud in all those, and I lost probably half of them. So I just to set the second straight. <laughs> but I want to ask, you never mentioned the issue on Electoral College about the issue of slavery when it happened. I haven't seen one, you know, remark about it. Didn't that play a prominent part in setting up Electoral College? Yeah. The three fifths clause of the Electoral College were, are both now seen by most historians as having a suppressive uh, attempt to continue slavery. Uh, and to give the South more oomph in the, both the Senate and in the Electoral College than it otherwise would have had. Is that a fair reading? Yeah, go ahead. We, yeah, we, we didn't mention it here, but we had that exact discussion today. And he, he said it better than I, so I'm going to pass it off. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons we love the Electoral College is because it's rooted in our history. But things that are rooted in our history are stained by slavery and racism. And so, yes, we're, we're revering an institution that was rooted in maximizing the power of slaveholding states. You know, for a lot of, like I teach constitutional law and for the students that I have, we talk about the three-fifths compromise and they're outraged that we would only count a human as three-fifths. And they don't realize that that wasn't the problem. The problem is that they got any counting at all because the, the, they were used as chits in this game of politics. You couldn't vote if you were an enslaved person, but we wanted to count you when we got our congressional seats. So it was the three that was the, that was the controversial part, not that, that it was a fraction. And, and the Electoral College baked that in, as obviously as you know, which is why you raised this. And so it does, it, it's this institution that was meant to magnify the, the, the power, the political power of slaveholding states that really gave us the Electoral College in the first place, and I think is another reason why people feel uncomfortable with it today. Didn't the 11th Amendment even make it firmer? So the 11th Amendment comes and it, it kind of adjusts the Electoral College slightly to make it even a more... 12th Amendment. The 12th. Yes. The 11th is okay, right. Yes, the 12th Amendment. It, it locks in the Electoral College uh, in a way that really maximizes power for states that used to be slaveholding states. Right. Oh, over here. He's going to come back forward here. Uh, 2020 election fraud question. Presumably, uh, if you are a poll worker, there's some sort of a penalty if you're involved in some kind of an election fraud. And there has not been, to the best of my knowledge, a single case of that brought forward. Am I wrong about that? Am I missing something? And if I'm not, you would think this would just destroy the election fraud argument. I don't, I, if you are a poll worker who commits election fraud, it'd be the same as a person who does, yes. I don't know of a poll worker who has been charged with any sort of election fraud. There are new laws that that make it a little more, <laughs> that have stiffer penalties on poll workers who might engage. Um, there but I, there I don't, are some instances, I, and I would have to look this up and I'd be happy to follow up with you. 
about the exact date. I know there are six or eight poll workers or poll judges um, who have admitted to engaging in some kind of fraud. Some of them, even though they were polling judges, they didn't do anything with the ballots in their precincts. They voted twice. Um, some of them were found to have uh, siphoned off some of the absentee ballot votes. And, and in, a, in a twist of fate, the, the ones that became the most notorious in the last year were Republicans, because that was seen as it must be Democrats doing this. Would, and, and I think your last point is the most difficult, and that is, wouldn't that stamp out the, the voter argument. fraud narrative? It's such a sticky narrative. You know, we're, we're liberals up here, supposedly. I voted for George W. Bush in 2000. I voted for Mitt Romney in 2012. I don't talk about my voting preferences to many people because I don't think it matters. Because I think people out there who think there's fraud and know that in my life I voted for you know, six different presidents uh, or six different presidential elections and I voted for some Republicans and some Democrats, that won't change their mind. They'll still say, well, if you don't think there's voter fraud, you're, you're off the deep end. And if, if you're really a Republican, you're a rhino. And so I don't know how to break through that because you can't get re responsible Republicans to say it and break the, the narrative. You can't get data to. So, you're correct on the fact that there, have, there has not been uh, uh, people put in jail for 2020 fraud because it didn't happen. But I don't think that's going to solve the narrative making that point, unfortunately. Over here, coming soon. Could you give me an argument to discuss with people who say that the only reason the Electoral College is there is to prevent California and New York from electing our president? Well, their population, Florida, Texas, California, New York, Illinois, those populations are growing. Uh, that's yeah. going to work both ways. The electoral, California is only going to get... That's always the argument that comes up. Right. I mean, how to argue against that? Would New York and California have a lot more... Would their numbers matter more if not for the Electoral College? I mean, that is absolutely true. Um, so I, I'm sort of stumped as a way to sort of disprove that. Um, but I, you know, why else does the electoral, why does it exist at all <laughs> is, is a hard thing to argue for right now other than our history. Um, so those states would have a lot of power, but um, have so what a lot of, you know, a lot of other states who, who receive no attention would receive more attention from political candidates. I mean, right now, New York and California, we rarely see a presidential candidate in New York stop by other than to collect their cash at private parties. And for that, they all come and they all come frequently. But I, one, do you have a... So one of the I didn't answer your changes, question. I acknowledge that fully. <laughs> well, one thing is to let people know states don't elect, wouldn't elect the president, voters would. So yes, people who live in California would have a say. So let's humanize it first instead of saying these big states. But oh, I like what, what I do think that, that the Electoral College does is it gives voice to political minorities. So Democrats in Utah right now have no hope, no reason to be talked about, no reason to even show up. Because Utah's five Electoral College votes will be redder than the blood in my arm. And, and, and Republicans in California have no reason to be interested in politics. If you got rid of the Electoral College, then every candidate wants to get the most number of votes. A Democrat wants to go to Utah and get those Democratic votes because they'll count in their ledger. And so especially for political minorities, Republicans in Connecticut, the, getting rid of the Electoral College gives them a reason to care. And so that that's, doesn't matter what state you're in. And that hopefully could help your friends recognize, okay, especially if they're in the minority in their state, their, vo their vote would matter every bit as much as the Democrat in California. It's one to one. And so that might give you some purchase. But isn't it also the case, let's say that, you know, Texas, every election cycle, they say it's trending blue. It hasn't. It's still red. Florida is trending red. If those two states were blue, Democrats would win every time, right? So that the Electoral College would be a slam dunk if you get all the existing blue states and those two giant blue states. So even in the Electoral College, this is going to be a crisis. And so it's not clear how it all works out if you shift the system. Well, presuming that the Republicans and the 
don't figure out a different platform to pull those people back. If they right. saw that happening, they might, have they might not keep the same platform. Like they said in 2012 in their postmortem, we have a problem with demographics and long-term issues. At some point they would say, if we're gonna lose every time, maybe our ideas aren't winning ideas. So maybe we need to soften our stance on abortion Maybe we need to soften our stance on guns, whatever it is or that we think. Or immigration or whatever. Or right. immigration, whatever it is we think that the, that the country isn't hearing from us, I would suspect they would change. And then some of those voters who are voting Democratic would say, I don't want to vote for the Democrats. I have to, but these people now are more attractive. So it would be dynamic. If we locked in the platform from today and then let the demographics run, yes. But the parties are malleable enough. I think they'll shift as that goes along to prevent that from happening. You're an optimist. <laughs> uh, I'm feeling a little dense about the voter ID issue. Uh, I'm having trouble figuring out what a system would look like if we didn't have voter IDs for registration or for proving who you are. Uh, I, I just can't imagine how such a system would work, and if the criticism is that we ought to make it easier for people to get IDs, my understanding is, and it may be very imperfect, is that a lot of these so-called voter suppression laws like Indiana went out of their way to make it very, very easy for people to get alternative IDs. I think some states still don't require ID. To, I mean, to register to vote, you do have to prove your citizenship and, and some way i mean different states have but like what i do always say about voter id is i don't show an id when i go to vote in new york we don't have a voter id law new york has all sorts of problems i'm sure many of you would argue but there no one is saying that new york is overrun by voter fraud voter id is just it isn't an issue in new york that's discussed we don't have it we don't show an id it's just not a thing so I think that's part of things is that when you don't have it in your state, it doesn't seem very odd. But you, you, there are there are checks when someone registers to vote. Um, you have to provide some proof of who you are. Yeah. The question is, what is that proof? It's not whether there, or not there's proof. It's can I bring in my rent bill? Can I sh can I can I show you my credit card? Can I does it have to have a picture on it? Does it have to be issued by the government? Those are the questions that the debate comes up. It's not whether you show, when you register to vote, you're either at the DMV, and so there's some record that you're going along with the government, you're showing them a utility bill so they can put your address on your license. And the debate was, Indiana didn't make it easy. And then when they were challenged in court, and the lower court said, oh, this is a really bad thing, then they did make it easy. And that's when the Supreme Court said, oh, that's okay. And so as the states loosen the rules, so today or yesterday, Idaho just changed their law and they said, you can't use a student ID. It's the same thing in Texas. So they had a list of eight IDs you could use, a hunting license, a driver's license, a passport, and they took student IDs off. That makes it a strict state. Why? Uh, because the thought is that students are um, liberal and Idaho's very conservative. And so it's one way to, to say, well, but can you trust the university to give the right ID? the same amount I trust the fish and wildlife to counter at the grocery store to give me a fishing license. So it's, the debate is not whether you're showing this, it's just how, many diff, how broadly or easy it would be to show that. And so that, that, I, I don't know if that answers the, the rigmarole of how challenging it is, but people have to identify themselves. There's no question there. We've got time for about two more questions here. Um, prior to the most recent midterm elections, our president referred to the election law changes in Georgia as Jim Crow 2.0. Today, there was a um, poll published by the University of Georgia interviewing African Americans and asking them about their voting experiences dur in Georgia during, during this most recent midterm election. 74% of African Americans described their experience as excellent. 94% of them said it was either good or excellent, and 0% of them said that it was poor. It seems to be a, some disconnect between Jim Crow 2.0 and the poll of the actual African Americans actually voting in Georgia and how they feel about those election laws. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that that's right, that overwhelmingly about 2022 and 2020, people felt it was overall pretty easy to vote 
when they got there. So you're right. I mean, it goes a little to what we talked about before when those laws are enacted, voting rights groups. And in Georgia, there has been unbelievable groundswell of get out the vote movements and making sure and going into communities and educating. And so it did turn out in a way that was very positive. They didn't have the long lines in Georgia that they did in 2020 and that they had had in the primaries. They sort of looked at it and, and fixed the problem. But I don't think one can necessarily say there was no problem with those laws because the election turned out fine. I, I always go back to like, what did, what purpose did the laws serve? And, uh, and are they necessary? Was all of this hubbub turn out be, to be needed? But you're right, people in Georgia really hit the ground. The election workers worked really hard. They worked on their line problems and it was an extremely efficient election in Georgia. You think I... I think you're right. I think two, two things came to mind to me. One is when we, think, talk, when we pull people and ask them about confidence in the election, um, one of the, the subgroups that finds elections to be the most trustworthy are the people whose candidate won. What do you so, know? so on one hand, I would say, well, Raphael Warnock was the choice of African-American voters by far, even though um, uh, Herschel, Walker. Herschel Walker, excuse me, was, was in the race and had, had siphoned some of those votes. So that would explain some of it. But I, to, to be more direct to your answer, President Biden made a really dumb statement, in my opinion. I think it's an offense to Jim Crow laws where there was physical violence and we were preventing anyone from voting to say, you can't give someone water in line, yeah. Jim Crow 2.0. That was to me I think a political I agree statement with that, right. that was that as well. misguided. Can you could, go to 46, could, please? Could, could, we, uh, could we say that maybe the, um, the right's focus on voter fraud is matched by the left's voter focus on voter suppression? I would agree with that. If you just look at 46, the, the recent slide, another Aaron Geiger Smith, the bottom line is this, don't use pundits as your primary news source. And I think President I stand Biden by that. made a terrible mistake there. <laughs> and you shouldn't use the president as your primary news it, source. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, or any that's political true figure, too. Really. Or any political but I mean, figure. it cheapens yeah. the horrors of black codes and Jim Crow to say that Georgia's law is 2.0 or that it's even in the same universe as those laws. And I think that's part of a... a larger problem of our time, which is extremism. Um, a lot of voters uh, don't do their own thinking and their own research. They listen to the silo that they like best, and, the, and both sides are screaming bloody murder about the other, and this is creating a kind of a crisis of confidence in the country that's really damaging us. And we've had these periods before, but this is thanks to social media and cable news. It's a particularly virulent time for all of this. And, the answer to that is another one of our conversations. Well, it's completely distracting us. You're right. The suppression laws are not having the effect people claim. The voter fraud is not having the claim. And everyone's yelling about it. And what aren't we paying attention to? What our Congress is doing? If you get a chance, there's a really interesting short article by Nate Cohn in the New York Times this week where he was uh, saying, you know how we passed this um, stimulus bill in 2010 and Republicans lost their minds and the entire Tea Party movement came out to tear down government because of it? We just passed a stimulus bill that was a million times bigger than that, and no one cared because they were worried that Dr. Seuss books had been banned off the shelves. And we're worried about voter fraud, and we're looking over here, and our government is doing things that we're not paying attention to. And I view some of these arguments about voter fraud as, like I said, lose your sleep over something more meaningful than this because it's not a problem, and it's distracting us from, big pro from bigger issues. James. I really hope that the Vail Symposium helps us have uh, more vibrant and civil dinner table discussions. Who has one question to take us home tonight? There was one over here. All right. But how about these two? Have they provided some clarification? <laughs> this is so... This is what the Vail Symposium does. I mean, tonight was an extraordinary night in clarification of complex issues. And although we only touched on some of them, I think you, you, you can take reliable um, evidence home that you can use because there's been a special effort to be careful, nuanced, civil, and nonpartisan. And that's an unusual thing, as you know, but the Vail Symposium can really wear that with pride. 
this will be quick before you get a beer. Um, what's your attitude about obligatory voting such as Australia? Obligatory voting, quickly. You know, I think because what my primary concern has turned into after doing all this is turnout and getting as many people to vote, especially as many young people to vote, I love it and I want to say I'm for it and I, our country is just not one I want to say I'm for it and I can't quite get there because I just don't think as Americans you should certainly have the right to vote and you should sit it out if you feel you need to. I, I, I just Freedom. can't get there. I try to convince myself on it and I, I can't get there. Would it have an effect on our turnout rate? Absolutely. I don't want the government telling me what to do and I don't want them to tell me to vote even though I think people should vote more and to be more... Uh, a little bit more cynical about this. There's nothing more American to me than having the right to do something that's bad for myself. And I would say that not voting is bad for myself, but I feel like I want the right to do that become an American. Well, don't, don't tread on Doug. So uh, I'll give you just one quick story about this. So when James Madison ran for Congress for the first time, the custom in Virginia was that you have, you have a, a barbecue uh, because these votes were held in sort of public places and they were kind of holidays. People would come in in their horses and their carts and so on. And Madison said to Jefferson, I think the idea of serving Applejack and whiskey at these things is really undignified. I'm not going to do it. And Jefferson said, yeah, you might want to rethink that. And Madison lost. And when he stood again, he had plenty of Applejack <laughs> and he swept into power and became one of the most important Americans in our history. So. You know, Americans don't like to be told what to do, but they do like incentives. Yes, and so if we, get, if we gave every American a $250 tax break for voting, they'd be piling into those polling sure. places. So you're taking us out. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Geiger-Smith, hey Professor Doug Spencer, and Clay Jenkinson. If I could have a quick show of hands, was this a valuable discussion? Are you glad you spent your evening with us? I'm so grateful for that.